instruction of the reading of the Word. Would you stand, please? We're in Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, and I'll read audibly, follow with me in your Scripture silently as I read. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, And thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod when he privately had called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was when they saw the star they rejoiced with exceeding great joy and when they were come into the house they saw the young child with mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and being warned of god in a dream that they should not return to herod they departed into their own country another way. Thank you, and we may be seated. We understand as we talk about wise men, and we'll see this throughout the service in this time together, as we talk about wise men, these were wise men, and wise men are still needful and necessary today. It is very, very clear in Corinthians, the first chapter, the 18th verse and following, and I'll read a few of those verses for us. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto them which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath uh, not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And it goes on to talk about the wise versus the foolish, and what a wise person does is they hear the Word of God, they heed the Word of God, they believe the Word of God. And so in this text, I want us to think for a moment about wise men. Wise men. We're going to see three things in this few moments together. Notice, first of all, the wistful seeking recorded. And secondly, the worshipful submission revealed. And thirdly, the willing sacrifice reviewed. Notice in that first verse, the night fact it's the first ten verses, the half of the text, what I call the wistful seeking recorded. Notice, first of all, the setting, the setting of the text. May I remind us in the uh, fulfillment of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ fulfilled all of the scriptures in relationship to his first coming, his second coming, and what shall take place in view of both. The setting here is the place called Bethlehem. He is the control of the universe. The G Jesus Christ has been born. Galatians 4, 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. And it's the fullness of time. Jesus Christ has been born. Some theologians and historians tell us this could be as much as two years from the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ when this kind of text is found in its context in historicity. But we find here the setting that is recorded. In that setting, we see the place. It is Bethlehem. Because Micah tells us, Micah 5, 2, that the place that Jesus Christ would be born would be in Bethlehem. You recall in our earlier study 
in relationship to Joseph and Mary leaving uh, Galilee that they might go uh, to Bethlehem. Because Bethlehem is the place that God had designated in his word and all of his prophetic texts is the place where the Lord Jesus Christ would be born. This setting we find is in Bethlehem. Joseph and Mary had traveled some 80 miles to go from Galilee, Nazareth. And as they are leaving Nazareth to go into Bethlehem, they were being registered for taxation in that particular era in that day. In the movement as God would have it because of God's sovereignty, making the determination that his scripture is going to be fulfilled just as he said. One of the things that always intrigues me, challenges me, encourages me is to understand if God said it, that settles it because it will come about just as he has said it would. We don't have to worry about, is this true? Will it happen? It's simply a de facto statement that God said it. That settles it. There are multiple number of people today that disavow, disbelieve, and challenge the written, reveal, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. I'm satisfied to read it, and as I read it, multitudes of times I have to dig deeper to understand exactly what God is saying, but I'm satisfied in my heart that he is absolutely on time in every occasion that he has said. So we see the place is Bethlehem, the period, the scripture says here, in the days of Herod the king. Why is that important? Why is it necessary? You recall it's Herod the king, and you'll find in the 16th verse of this same chapter that Herod the king made the decision that all of the boy babies from two years old and younger he would put to death because his throne, he feels, is in danger. We see in this text the period in the days of Herod the king. Herod, let me just give you a little biographical thumbnail sketch of Herod the king. The historians tell us that he was a vile, wicked, murderous man. The Jews hated him. He was cruel. He was uh, one that felt insecure in everything that took place. He was insecure in his life, in his leadership. He was insecure in his position in his, uh, on the throne. A man would not, uh, he, he was a man that would not tolerate anything that would be the possibility of any rivalry uh, for his throne. He was simply a vile, vicious, wicked man. He had already murdered his son and one of his wives. Someone said, and may I quote, it was safer to be Herod's pig than one of his sons, end quote. That's how wicked and vile and evil he was. So it uh, uh, should cause us to recognize this is the period, this is the place, this is the time that this particular text takes place. We need to, as we study the scripture, understand uh, the particular chronology of it. We need to understand the time, the place, the setting. We need to understand who's speaking, what it's speaking about, who it's speaking to, and how it then can be uh, applied, what is the applicability in our hearts and in our lives. As we look at this text, we see not only the setting recorded, but we see the seeking recognized. The seeking recognized. The scripture says, Behold, I've always enjoyed that word, it means look intently and see. Behold, the scripture says, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, one of the things that I need to just tuck in a little footnote, it doesn't say there were three wise men. You hear this always in our songs and in uh, many of the Christmas plays that's put on uh, for the Christian season of Christmas. But there, the scripture doesn't say there were three wise men. There were three gifts that were given, we'll see, in the 11th verse. That doesn't mean there were three wise men. And we'll talk about who are wise men in just a moment. But uh, they're looking for the one that's born king of the Jews. He didn't uh, uh, strive to be king. He didn't strive for any election to climb up the political ladder. He did not play Joe Biden in the era in which he was living, where he didn't do anything but stay in the basement and run a campaign that was uh, fallaciously flawed. Uh, but here is Jesus Christ that is the king of the Jews. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. Where the scripture says, For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Uh, it does not say three wise men, but they say that we've seen the star. It is the indication there. And make a note in your leisure. Go back and research it. In Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, it was the prophetic text in relationship to one of the signs of Jesus Christ and where he would be. And it talked about the star. And these wise men evidently knew the scripture. These wise men evidently knew the Old Testament. These wise men had seen the star and they were following the star. May I say to us, wise men still seek the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes wisdom from on high today to seek Jesus. There are a lot of folks in many positions and powerful uh, political settings and those that have prestige and prosperity and those that have prominence that uh, we all look to and many of us unfortunately look to 
in some realm of uh, a sense of honoring them and recognizing them. But I want us to understand that wise men are those that seek Jesus, not seek necessarily seek political office, not necessarily seek to have uh, the goods of life, but to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes God's wisdom to seek Christ and to submit and surrender under his lordship in our lives. Most of the time, most people are simply trying to find out what we can gain, get, and gather in this life rather than seeking the Lord Jesus Christ as we serve him. I want us to notice two or three things in this text. Notice in that second verse, their realization. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? They realize that the Scripture is very, very clear. They recognize that the Scripture points out to Jesus Christ as being born king. Again, he was not elected king. He was born king and king of the Jews as well as king of the universe. Matthew 27, 11 says, Jesus' trial before before his crucifixion, Pilate said, Art thou the king of the Jews? And then in Matthew 27, 37, Hanging over the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sign read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. It was recognized throughout the Scripture that Jesus Christ was born King of the Jews. May I read to us some verses in relationship to that? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. And it goes on to point out then, as you look at the follow-up text of that, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 33, it talks about his birth. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 through 33, points out very clearly as the Angel Gabriel is making the announcement to Mary. I call it the announcement of the first Christmas. He's making the announcement to Mary that she's going to have a son, and he is going to be uh, uh, God come into flesh, the 33rd, uh, 31st, 32nd, 35th through the, th- uh, yeah, through the 35th verse. talks about that, that that which is taking place is of God. And then in Revelation chapter uh, 17, verse 14, we read these words about that. In seventeen fourteen, the Scripture says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Even in the prophetic text of the closing days in the book of the Revelation, he is referred to as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it takes wisdom for an individual to recognize that. May I say to us in this time together, multitudes will strive to have prominence and position, not realizing that the real wise person is the individual that has said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, that said yes to Christ as Savior, yes to the King of kings and Lord of lords in his life. Then when you read in Revelation chapter 19 and in verse 16, there's a very similar statement that is made about Jesus. And hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of kings and Lord of lords. One of the things that is... uh, so difficult for humanity is that we, for the most part, because of a wicked heart, according to Jeremiah seventeen nine, because of that desperately evil, wicked heart, man somehow, some way, thinks that if you lean on Jesus, if you lean on anything that's spiritual, that that is a crutch, and that we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and we do not need Jesus. Contrary-wise, all throughout the Scripture, you find wisdom is pointing to the individual that is seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in Jeremiah 23, 5, the Scripture prophesied that Jesus would be born king. The Scripture says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will rise, raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. It's speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men think that they're wise in rejecting Jesus. Men think that they're wise as Joe Biden when he said that the Christians are the uh, uh, scourge of the earth, that the Christians are simply the scum of the earth. And you find those like Barack Hussein Obama that's already said that we want to cling to our guns and God and religion and not realizing and recognizing that's demeaning the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's exactly what the Scripture's pointing to. Wise men, wise God calls men wise that say yes to him. God calls men fools or foolish that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Wise men, which simply means magi or learned men, educated men, those that study astronomy, not the astrologists, but studying of astronomy. It's not the uh, uh, ones today that study the horrible scope. That's not what it's talking about at all. It's those that study astronomy, men that are learned men, those that are studying the stars and the planet. This is the reason when they see the star that's pointed out in prophetic text in Numbers chapter 24, they understand this is speaking of none other than Jesus Christ. And so they strive to find Jesus. They follow the star, the indicator, the pointer, the prophetic finger that's pointing to the place where Jesus will be born. For we have seen his star. They knew the Old Testament. They recognized the special star. It wasn't just an uh, individual star. I have read behind so many foolish men that have behind their names scholars and theologians, and they tried to point out a time where we know that back at a certain date at a certain time, there was a special event that took place, and the uh, skies were all clouded, and only one star could be seen, and etc., 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 etc. They come up with all kinds of ironies that they point out as the rationale behind this star. That is not so at all. God said it, that settles it, and it is that star that God had pointed to and talked about prophetically that these wise men, these magi, saw the star. They saw the star. They recognized that star, and they're coming following the star to find the Lord Jesus Christ. The setting recorded, the seeking recognized, but I want you to notice the suspicion revealed in verse 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is a unique text, by the way. It's got some things in it that you'll not find any place else in Scripture that is fascinating, intriguing, challenging, and convicting when we understand it. Notice in 3, 4, 5, and 6 quickly. When Herod the king had heard these things, <clears throat> what things? That these wise men were there to find Jesus. When he heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, And thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art thou art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. A challenging, fascinating, intriguing, informative text for us. Notice this suspicion. The scripture says he was troubled. That's putting it mildly. That's putting it mildly. When you look down under the rocks, as I call it, and you study the biblical text in the Greek text, it means he was shaken, he was stirred, he was agitated, he was unsettled, he was surprised. He was, if you put it in the young blood vernacular, he was bent out of shape. <laughs> he was bent out of shape with what he heard. When he heard what they were doing, why they were there, what they were looking for, he was agitated and troubled. He was shaken and stirred. He was fearful of his position. Keep in mind, Herod was one that was always fearful of anything, anybody that he thought in some fashion would undermine or would take over his throne as king. He was one that was frightened to death that someone else would move into that position. Those that are afraid of the orange man today, President Trump, you know, they call him the orange man. There are a lot of folks that are petrified with the orange man because he came into Washington thinking he's going to drain the swamp and he found it was a sewer. And as a result of that, the uh, uh, one world global governance approach that they thought would take place with Hillary Clinton going into office, it shook them to the core. They were agitated, bent out of shape, anxious over that. They've not ceased that whatsoever. They're still on the track of trying to destroy anything that comes in their path that will prevent them from carrying out what they want to do. Very similar to what we see in this text with King Herod. He's bent out of shape. He's agitated because he is fearful of his position. He was suspicious of any rumor that may or may not be true of any other king. Herod was not the rightful king for the, from the line of David when you study the text. He was an Edomite, and he would destroy anybody or anything because of any suspicion or that he felt somehow, some way would take his throne. That's the kind of king that we're looking at. This is the man that's inviting those. Come on over. I want to talk with you guys. Let's talk about what's taking place. I want to know why you know this, who said this, where did it come from, and what are you looking for, and why are you looking looking for him. Notice the request in verse 4. 
And when he had gathered the chief priests and the scribes and the people, notice the three groups, the priests, the scribes, and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Notice the request. It's not really a request. It's a demand. But in that demand, he gathered these together. That's the spiritual leaders and all of the scribes. And the scribes are the scholars, the learned people, along with the people in general. He gathered together a committee uh, at a called drop uh, last minute uh, a call, if you will. He put together a committee. And in that committee, he put together those that were the uh, learned scholars. He put together those spiritual leaders, the religious leaders of that day, with a group of people. And in that, the Scripture says, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And when you analyze the text, it wasn't just something he made one request. He would basically poll the audience. What do you know? What do you know? What have you been told? Tell me where you learned that from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Through the whole crowd, it was a matter of polling the audience. It was a matter of challenging the people. It was a matter of interrogation as to what they knew at that time. He was petrified because these wise men said they were coming to find Jesus because he was the one that they were following the star to find, the one that's the king of the Jews. He is frightened of that. Notice the response in verse 5 and 6. These spiritual leaders, these Bible scholars, as you'd call them today, and these, this group of the average people knew the Scripture, and they quoted the Scripture, and they were quoting from Micah uh, 5, verse 2, 3, and 4, and they were quoting from that which is found referring back to that in John chapter 7, verse 42. They knew the Scripture, and they knew exactly what they were looking for. They responded. They knew the Scripture. They knew what the, uh, where the Savior was to be born. They knew what the star indicated. And one thing to know intellectually, and they knew that. These wise, these wise men are being asked, but these that are the scribes and these that are the scholars, these that are religious leaders, they had the answers, but listen very carefully. Their answers were intellectually borne out not as a result of an intimate relationship to God through Christ that they give an answer. There are multitudes today that can give you an answer how many books in the Bible, who wrote the books in the Bible. They can quote John 3.16 in 14 different languages. They can quote it backwards and forwards, etc., etc. But that does not mean a person saved because he can simply quote Scripture because he knows where something is found. These people, when the king asked them, the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders and the scholars, and demanded of them what, uh, where Christ should be born, they gave the answers because they knew the Old Testament. They knew the letter of the law. They knew the Word of God, but they did not know the Savior of the Scripture. It's one thing to know it intellectually, another thing to know Jesus internally. There's a difference in knowing philosophically and personally the Lord Jesus Christ. I met multitudes, multitudes of people that say, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, and yet do not really know Him intimately. There's a difference in the word no, gnosis, and epigenosis, that is having a personal, first-hand, experiential knowledge of Jesus. Multitudes of people today know about Jesus. They can tell you that they know who he is, that he is God come in the flesh, but yet they do not know him, having a personal relationship with him, and there is a vast, vast difference. Natch Pelosi says she knows God. I won't go any further with that statement. Let you think on it a while. There are a lot of folks today that think that they know something about spirituality. Ralph Northam, the uh, uh, one that's over at Virginia, the governor of Virginia, uh, just made the statement as I read an article earlier today. He makes the statement that you can worship God in a car, you can worship God online, you can worship God outside. You don't have to be in a building, and therefore he has released his latest uh, lockdown, including churches, begins tomorrow in the state of Virginia. And he is absolutely doing that in retaliation to anything that's called spirituality, Christianity, or godliness, because he is an absolute atheist, heathen, in all that he said and done, regardless of what he says. He might say, I know God. He might say, I know Jesus, but his actions and his words are absolute belial anything, belie anything that he says in relationship to knowing Jesus Christ. He's a lost man. And we have multitudes of those across America today. And the thing that is so sad, we find multitudes of those that are lost saying that they're in the position of leadership and in a position to crush the church. And multitudes today are trying to do that because they do not know Jesus Christ, and yet they claim to be wise men. They're foolish men under the guise of having wisdom, but they're lost and without a knowledge of Jesus Christ at all. 
Not only do we see the setting recorded and the seeking recognized and the suspicion revealed, but I want you to notice the search resumed in verse 7 and 8. The search resumed. The scripture says, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. That sounds like a socialist, Marxist, BLM, Democrat, communist lie. They have, they have gotten some of the things that they do in modern political circles. They've gotten it from the right source. That's the devil because he's the liar and the father of all lies. Notice as you look at the text, the repeated inquiry. Verse 7, inquired of them diligently. Now listen, he's already had the meeting uh, with the uh, religious leaders. He's already had the meeting with the scholars and the people in general. He's already asked them what did they know, and they've given him an answer intellectually, not because they know Jesus intimately, but intellectual answers to his questions. But here's his inquiry, repeated inquiry. He inquired of them diligently. That is, the wise men he kept asking them and prodding them and asking them and prodding them. Perhaps as he would ask them as a group, three wise men or ten wise men, whatever the number may be, the wise men. He would ask them as a group. And then I'm sure in that uh, term diligently asking them, he would ask, now are you sure? Are you positive? Have you told me all that you know? And would challenge them, almost like General Flynn in his interrogation with the FBI agents asking them the question, trying to find a lie or trying to somehow find where they are wrong in their statement or wanting to know so that they will give absolute details so that he will be able to find Jesus and put him to death. Herod wanted to know, what time did the star appear? Already in his callous, cruel, cold, devious heart, he planned to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Drop down in your Bible there for a moment. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and set forth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. He was calculating about the time that Jesus was born. He was calculating based on the approximate age of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he made a mathematical decision that Jesus Christ would be someplace between two years old and younger. So he made the decision that he was going to slay all of the boy babies in that general age group. And here is that setting. Here's the picture. We see this man repeatedly, the king repeatedly inquired of the Wise men diligently asking them and asking them and asking them again when they had seen the star and what the star had indicated to them. Notice not only do we see the repeated inquiry, but notice the repulsive instructions. The repulsive instructions in verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, now listen, notice what he says to them. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently. Just as the scripture said, he had diligently inquired of them. He says, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. He is saying, boys, listen. You find Jesus, you come back and you tell me, because I want to do just as you're doing. I want to go worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And the farthest thing from the truth could never have been found in place in the Scripture than that statement made by the king. He did not want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. Lost men still hate the Lord Jesus Christ even today. We can't pray in public places in Jesus' name. We are denied uh, the opportunity to say anything spiritually in public places. Perhaps you've heard me give the illustration before. On one occasion, the one that was to do the invocation at the Mandarin High School uh, graduation service had uh, dropped by the wayside for whatever the reason. I got a panic call from the one in charge with that. He uh, knew me, and he said, would you, be, would you be willing to come and do the invocation for the commencement service? And I said, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. Two days later, I got a little trifold in the mail telling me how to, play, how to pray a prayer. What's it called? A sectarian prayer, non-sectarian prayer. I wanted to make sure that I uh, prayed the prayer without saying in Jesus' name. I showed that to my bride. She said, what, are you still going to go? I said, yes. She said, what are you going to do with that? I put it in the trash can. 
<laughs> we had the commencement service, and they, my time came to stand and say something. I said something uh, briefly about the Scripture and the need to know Christ and the need to study the Word, and I prayed from the book of genera- gener- uh, generations, from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation, uh, giving the plan of salvation in my prayer, and I said, in Yahshua Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. You could hear a pin drop in that place. I knew that'd be my first only last time of being invited, and I was going to do all I could to give the gospel in those few minutes. <laughs> there are a lot of folks today that have the mindset and the attitude somehow uh, that uh, we uh, ought to be uh, subservient to the world. The world says, I hate Jesus Christ. The world says, I deny God. The world says, we're not going to bow and bend. The world says, we're wise in our own wisdom. And this is what you see in this text. The repulsive instructions that the king, King Herod, gives to the wise men. Go find him. Seek out for him. Find him. Look diligently when you found him. Bring me word that I might come and worship him also. Not only do we see the setting recorded and the seeking recognized and the suspicion revealed and the search resumed, but I want you to notice the star reappeared in verse 9 and 10. The scripture says, when they had heard the king, they heard him out, they listened to him. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before Pros in front of them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The star, the sign of Messiah the sign of the place of his birth, which they had first seen, now reappeared. I find it absolutely intriguing, challenging, exciting to understand the sovereignty of God and to recognize here they are this time out. We don't know how long this time out was that they were having this dialogue and discussion with the king when he was inquiring of the wise people as they thought in society of that day. And then the interrogation of the wise men. But when they finished that journey, that sidetrack, if you will. They went back out, and time they did. God, in his supernatural power, allowed the star to reappear, that they could follow that star, just as though it had never ceased, just as though there had never been a deviation from it. The star reappears, that they might follow the star, fully filling out, fulfilling what the prophecy says. It says, and stood over Bethlehem. It's like the star is moving, and as the star moves, keep in mind, they didn't have boat, uh, motorboat, airplane, or any uh, train mechanism for transportation in that day. We do not know how long. Some have said that it was as, probably as much as 18 to 24 months in their journey of following the star. And in doing so, this star reappeared so that they could see precisely where uh, Bethlehem was. And the star traveled and they followed the star and it stood still and pointed, if you will. It's like the finger of God in the star pointing to Bethlehem as to the place where Jesus Christ was born. God always is on time. He's never late. He's never ahead of time. He's never in any way detoured from his plans. He provides through the work of the Holy Spirit's uh, Holy Spirit guidance for everyone that's willing to find and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of us would consider ourselves wise men, wise women, wise today? That's what Solomon did throughout the book of Proverbs. It was a parallel comparison and contrast of wise and foolish, wise men and foolish men, wisdom and alike thereof. Notice, out of the wistful seeking recorded, I want us to notice in verse 11 what I call the worshipful submission revealed. The worshipful submission revealed. Notice the submission reviewed in that 11th verse Wonderful study if we just look at verses 11 and 12. And when they came, when they were come into the house. Now, keep in mind, this is after the birth of Jesus. He's no longer in the animal stall. He's no longer wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's no longer just a babe. It would be the word brephos. He's now uh, a technon, a young child, as the scripture would call it. And here in this text, we see the submission that's reviewed. And they fell down and worshipped him. 
That word uh, fell down indicates subjection. It indicates submission. It indicates a willing heart in humility. They didn't walk in and say, hello, king. They didn't walk in with an arrogant attitude. They didn't walk in with a uh, mindset of we're wise men and we're here to see that little toddler. That's not what they walked in. They walked in in the realization this is a doing of God. God's led us here. God's brought us to this point. We found the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We've seen Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah. And they fell down, the Scripture says, in humility and worshipped Jesus. I don't know how I can say it any more poignantly and personally than that. Multitudes today with a stiff-necked, arrogant feeling and attitude that I don't have to worship Jesus. I don't have to fall down on my knees and worship Him. You perhaps heard the story about a man and his wife. They were having all kinds of problems. He came home from work one afternoon, and she was there on her knees in front of the couch praying. He said, what are you doing? She said, I'm praying. He said, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> Somehow there's a mindset that uh, if we worship Jesus, if we would depend, if we depend on the Lord, if we seek His guidance and His wisdom, that somehow that means weakness. But the strongest man and the strongest woman, the strongest boy and the strongest girl that ever walked on the face of God's green earth are those that have said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. It takes wisdom from God to say yes to Christ and to be submissive to Him. It's an impossibility to worship Jesus with a prideful, arrogant, stiff-necked, uh, selfishness heart in our lives. We must be willing to surrender and submit to Him. And that's what they did time they walked in. They surrendered and submitted in worship before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen, this is not said in any negative fashion, but it's... The governor of Virginia said in demeaning fashion about you didn't have to be in a building. The scripture says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. When we come into a place that we call the church, we the people that have said yes to Christ, we make up the body of Christ. It's the local body of Christ and the universal body of Christ, those that have said yes to Jesus Christ. But when we come into this place, when we come into a place of worship, it is a place of holy ground. It is a place where we meet God. It is a place where we come and pray. It's a place where we come and praise God. It's a place where we come and honor Him. It's a place where we come in submission and surrender under his lordship it ought to be recognized as that across the nation in particular in the United States of America today you can say oh me or amen the submission reviewed but I want you to notice the service reminded and again it goes back they worshipped him they worshipped him our greatest service to the savior today is to worship him our greatest service to the Lord Jesus Christ today is submit and surrender under His Lordship. Our greatest worship today is to say, as the old song does, take my life and let it be only always used for Thee. May I remind us, these wise men worshipped Him, surrendering in subjection and submission of their lives unto Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And thirdly, I want us to notice, not all the wistful seeking Recorded, the worshipful submission revealed. But notice in verse 11 and 12, the capstone of the text. Notice the willing sacrifice reviewed. This is the point where, as I call it, the water hits the wheel, where the rubber hits the road, whatever term you want to use as a colloquialism. They gave willingly, the scripture says, Verse 11 again in verse 12. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Listen to what the Scripture is saying to us. They gave willingly, openly, unreservedly, unselfishly to the King of Kings. Notice three things in closing. Their sacrifice of time, their sacrifice of treasure, and their sacrifice of trust found in these two little verses. Verses 1 through 10, we'll not go back and read them. They didn't have jet airplanes or helicopters or motorboats or anything else 
It took them months and months and months in sacrificing their time to find Jesus. I believe we're just too busy in our lives today in society for a person to ponder and pause and to find the Lord Jesus Christ. See, keep in mind it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God that's seeking each and every one, wooing us unto himself that we might say yes to Jesus. But I think sometimes out of the busyness of life, I think oftentimes out of the confusion in society that we fail to hear that still small voice that would cause one to simply sacrifice time. Notice the text. It talks about as we see the time frame, as I've spoken of, the time frame of several months, perhaps as much as two years for them to arrive at Bethlehem. They left their family, their friends, and their jobs, the sacrifice of time to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We fail to sacrifice our time. He gives us, each and every one of us, we have the same number of hours each week. Each week. We have the same number of hours each month, each year. What do we do with that time? Do we sacrifice our time for Jesus? They sacrificed their treasure. The scripture says they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of these with real value. Not cheap imitations. But plentiful. Nevertheless. They gave Jesus the very best, not leftovers. Vance Havener wrote a book, a little booklet a number of years ago, said the God of the leftovers. He said with most Christians... It's two dollars worth to God. Chuck Swindoll restated that just a few years back. Most Christians will take the crumbs on the table and give to God. Most people will say today, uh, I'll give God a tithe if I have any money left. I'll give God the leftovers of my time. I'll give God the leftovers of my treasure. I'll give God the leftovers of what is in my life. These men, these wise men, were wise in their sacrifice of time. They're wise in their sacrifice of treasure. May I say to us, it was not leftovers, it was not scraps, it was not discards, but treasured, valuable gifts that they brought for the Lord Jesus Christ. The very best. Heard an evangelist tell the story a number of years ago, and I've never forgotten it. He was a farmer, lived out in the country. This preacher was from Arkansas, so it was an Arkansas farmer, if I would set the stage correctly. And he had taken God's tithe and bought him a mule with the $300, as the story goes, that was supposed to be his tithe. He needed another mule, so he bought the mule. Several weeks later, he called the pastor in a, uh, a very panicked tone. He said, Pastor, Pastor, I need to see you. Would you come by my house? I need to talk with you. I've had a tragedy to take place. And the pastor uh, got there as quickly as he could. And they had a conference. The man said, Come on out to the barn. I want to show you what's happened. Open the barn door, and there's his mule laying there dead. And he said, Pastor, that was $300. It was supposed to be my tithe money. And now my mule has died. You reckon God will take this and accept this as his tithe? <laughs> We want to give a dead mule to God for our tithe so often if we take that analogy and understand what I'm saying. Oft times we take the leftovers, uh, leftover of our time, talent, treasure, and testimony rather than giving the very best of what God has given us. God has provided for us abundantly for every need in our lives. And yet so often we look at it on the basis as Christians that we can't afford to give. We can't afford to tithe. We can't afford to give beyond the tithe number of years ago when we were first involved in the framing of this building and we were operating off pennies on trying to find pennies and chasing nickels, uh, uh, squeezing the nickel until the Indians riding the buffalo, as they used to say, <laughs> trying to put together dollars to build the building. And we challenged our congregation at that time to give a double tithe for 90 days and see if God will bless you. You'd be surprised what God did through that. We had a number of people that decided they would be uh, willing to take that offer and to double tithe for 90 days. One individual tithed for years and years and years and years and years as a result. He said, Pastor, you just can't outgive God. I started double tithing and I found that it works and I want to keep on keeping on in doing that. There are a lot of folks today that miss the blessings of God because we want to give God the leftovers and the crumbs off the table rather than the very best. These wise men were wise in their sacrifice of time, wise in their sacrifice of treasure. And in verse 12, they were wise in the sacrifice of trust. 
The Lord spoke to them in a dream, the Scripture says, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country another way. That was a sacrifice of trust. The Lord warned them. They obeyed him. They placed their faith and trust in what the Lord God had said, not what the king had told them, not what the king had suggested to them, but what God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, had said. Jesus Christ is that child that's born in Bethlehem. Jesus Christ is born king of the universe. And may I suggest to us, wise men still seek the Lord Jesus Christ today. Wise men surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wise men submit to the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and through their hearts, submitting to him day by day. The question is, how have we carried out this Christmas season? Are we honoring him? worshiping him, serving him? What is the condition of the heart? And that condition of the heart demands that we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. We're going to have a moment of brief invitation, and then we're going to make a transition to our Christmas tree and a brief thought, and then the opening of the gifts that we've given for the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Tom, do you have our music?